Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. This is your host, Ian Andrews. If you've followed the crypto space for any amount of time, you've probably encountered the phrase, code is law. Taken on its face, there's something appealing about code, you know, the language of computers, writing laws. It takes all the messy nuance of the legal system and says, let the computers decide. Of course, if you think one step further, you realize that code is written by humans and suffers all the same failings as any other human created system. So really, we ought to be saying code is code and law is law. Well, this week, I have the pleasure to interview an IP and copyright legal expert, Moish Peltz, who's a partner at FRB Law and co-chair of their emerging technologies and blockchain practice. He's going to explain the current state of copyright and IP laws as they apply to emerging technology like blockchain, NFTs, and AI-generated content. We break down some of the recent headline-grabbing cases, like the one about the Meta Birkin NFT that sparked a response from real-world Birkin bag manufacturer Hermes. We also talk about the current state of creator royalties and why many NFT marketplaces are slowly phasing them out. Now, remember that although Moish is a lawyer, he's not your lawyer. And since we go deep on many legal topics, it's important to note our podcasts are for informational purposes only. They're not intended to provide legal, tax, financial, or investment advice. Everyone listening out there should absolutely consult their own advisors before making any of these types of decisions. Today, I am joined by Moish Peltz, partner at Falcon, Rappaport, and Berkman LLP. Moish, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Ian. Thanks for having me on. So you've got an incredible background. We'll try and include a screenshot in the show notes of this. You've got some musical instruments, but I, I want to talk about these basketballs that are kind of above your head on top of the bookshelf, because I think it'll set a good frame for the discussion that we're planning to have today about intellectual property. Yeah, so these basketballs were one of the first merchandise items offered by uh, Yugo Labs, Board 8 Yacht Club, uh, which were a collaboration with this company, Round 21, which is a another blockchain company that's making merch for crypt- different crypto companies. And so they're a collab between Board Apes and Round 21 to create a Board Ape branded basketball. Those were offered as uh, benefits to, to early Board Ape holders. And so that makes you obviously an early Board Ape holder. It does. Mid-2021, I got in pretty early loved the concept of what they were doing and was just you know learning more about different nfts at the time and saw them and thought that would be my that was my first big nft purchase and i think one of the things that was unique at the time and maybe has been trend setting since is the team at yoga labs basically granted commercializability to the holders of the nft meaning if you own one you can put it in a movie you can print your own t-shirts you can do pretty much anything what have you been doing with your board ape yeah that's exactly right i mean as an ip attorney the notion and concept of having access to the intellectual property rights represented by the nft is one of the things that really drew me to board ape in the first place back in June 21 when that was kind of a new idea. And so as I noticed a lot of my clients getting into that space and trying to commercialize the IP rights represented by their NFTs, you know, I, I started thinking, well, what can I do with my NFT? And so certainly I've used it in the context of business generation of just it being my PFP, my persona on Twitter, other social media places, and then created business cards uh, using it for my legal services, I've even filed a trademark on behalf of our law firm for using it for legal services. And so just just as my clients experiment and we kind of help them think through and strategize about the legal concepts that come up with using the IP rights represented by the NFTs, me as an attorney and us as a law firm are, are, are doing that same thing. It's funny because my advice to anybody who comes to me and says, hey, I'm new to crypto. I don't I don't know anything. Where should I start? My advice often to them is take a small amount of money, whatever you don't mind losing. It could be $5, $10, $100. Go buy some crypto, probably start on a centralized exchange. Then you need to get a wallet like a MetaMask. Go connect it to a DeFi protocol. Swap whatever you bought into something else. Like, you know, just go experience it and learn how the tools work. And you've kind of taken this to the next level. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> with your practice here at the law firm. It's amazing. I, I love that you're that far into crypto. You're not just advising from a distance. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I agree with you. The only way to really learn these concepts in, in a really like deep way is not to read about them. It, it, you have to experiment. You have to play with them. You have to engage with the technology. You have to see what's coming down the pipeline. And, and from my perspective, right, in order to properly advise clients, like here's this new thing that's coming down. How do you think about it from a legal perspective? How do you contract for it? How do you uh, mitigate risk? You have to understand it. You have to understand where things can go wrong. And so I completely agree with what you said. The only way to really understand it and the best way for people to learn is to, to experiment and play with it and buy 
cry a little bit and an amount that you're okay losing and, and just go out there and, and see what happens. So shifting to your day job here a little bit, away from your NFT collection, I think one of the interesting comments that gets thrown around a lot in crypto is code is law. And there's sort of this implicit and sometimes explicit assertion that anything that happens on chain because it's cryptographically provable is therefore legally binding, equivalent in some ways to a contract. That's not at all true to my understanding. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Like how should people approach this this notion when they hear someone saying code is law? What's a sane reaction to that comment in your opinion? Yeah, it is an, an alluring comment. I do sympathize with it, both as a user of these systems and, and representing clients as well. The technology provides for ownership and transfer of ownership and ownership of digital assets. And the technology kind of is the land deed, the representation of ownership. So that is that is law. That is the final answer. And I think as we've learned over the past couple of years, that possession, while very valuable and perhaps <laughs> determinative in some circumstances, is not always consistent with the legal title and the right to own something, the right to commercialize something, to to do something else with it. And so you're seeing all of this, this come up a lot in what is effectively now ownership disputes generally governed by traditional legal principles. And courts are in fact engaging on these issues. People are losing crypto through exploits and, and then suing the exploiter, things like that nature, right? And so a court is then has to come in and decide, even though someone according to the blockchain has ownership, who is the party that, that should properly have ownership? Is that different than what the blockchain provides, and then ultimately, how do you go about enforcing that? Is your sense that courts, and I guess by extent, legislators, are they starting to adjust to the existence of blockchain? And this, you know, I think I've read some things in the news where individuals have been served via airdrop to a crypto address where it was sort of an anonymous plaintiff in a case. I don't have a good sense for like the broad sophistication level of understanding or like adaption towards the existence of blockchain in the legal system. And maybe particularly as it relates to intellectual property. What are the, some of the trends you're seeing there? Yeah, it's really difficult because blockchain is such a global phenomenon that is not bounded by jurisdictions. And of course, yeah. most courts are at least somewhat local in the sense that they're they're jurisdictional. You have a court for the U.S. or for, you know as a whole, Supreme Court. You have courts, the federal system. You have courts for each state. And so when you're thinking about the level of sophistication and understanding, it's obviously going to vary by venue and jurisdiction and basically the issues that are before that particular court. You know, I, I just came back from an international legal conference where I was talking about blockchain. And same thing, I think there's a varying level of understanding amongst attorneys, depending on what industry they're in, how much of that overlaps with blockchain technology, how much they've been called upon to, you know, really flex that muscle, understand it in context of their legal practice. And so I, I think we've seen maybe over the past three years, courts and attorneys have been increasingly required as part of their day-to-day -day jobs to understand these technologies, to pull them apart and to you know, either advise clients in the context of an attorney or as a judge, like to understand the principles and, and make a determination on some issue relevant to the issues presented by, by blockchain. And I'd say this is probably a, a rocky start over the past few years, right? I think there's cases where courts are getting that right and are understanding the technology. I think there's cases where you know more understanding would probably be beneficial both to the blockchain industry, but then also to courts, to regulators, to other participants in the ecosystem. I saw one of the recent cases, you, you had posted about it actually on your LinkedIn, was I believe a trademark infringement that Hermes filed against someone that had created an NFT project that was kind of derivative of the Hermes brand. Can you maybe overview that for us? And then like, did the court get it right? Did they understand the issues? Like, how did that all play out? Yeah, the Hermes one is is a really interesting court decision. And that was a case where Hermes, this like historic French fashion house has this famous Birkin bag. And then these, these bags are like tens of thousands of dollars. And this guy, Mason Rothschild, is this artist says, I'm creating a meta Birkin bag, which is this fuzzy NFT version of it that he sold a couple hundred NFTs that were digital meta Birkin bags for the metaverse. And Hermes filed a, a federal district court action in for asserting their, their trademark rights and particularly asserting that they're this famous 
brand. So there's kind of like superpowers that come with being famous. And so they were asserting these powers. They were also asserted anti-counterfeiting domain name type action by the metaburkins.com domain name. And this case went to a jury. So right, so a jury sat down and heard the arguments. One of the necessary elements was that they decided in one of the counts was that this individual was acting in bad faith. So I, I think this is a, a unique case where there was actually a finding of bad faith and that kind of colored everything that happened here. So the judge actually didn't decide. He decided that the case would go to the jury, but he didn't decide on the merits whether there was or was not bad faith. The jury did. And so you think about all that had to go into the legal teams from this fashion house and uh, the defense team for this artist, understanding him creating a fake NFT version of a Birkin handbag and marketing it and all things that go along with that. So the court, the attorneys, the jury had to kind of get up on the level with all this to understand what was happening. I think this is a case that probably was decided correctly. It will obviously be appealed. And it'll be interesting to see how an appellate court grapples with these issues if, if anything changes on appeal. But this is what we have at the, at the first instance at the trial level. You know, as a layperson here, right, of the two of us, the one that's not the lawyer, I don't think that if I went out and created a bag that looked arguably similar to an Hermes Birkin, and I called it a Birkin or some derivative, you know, Ian's Birkin, and sold it on eBay or Etsy or something like that, I don't think I would get very far, right? If I had any success with it at all, I'd get a call from the Hermes lawyers telling me to cease and desist and maybe, uh, you know, a process server asking me to show up in court. So... The twist here was obviously it was uh, digital only. There was no physical item or good. And so I imagine that was probably like a little bit of a hurdle. But I took away from some of the reading I did on this that it was also perhaps a joke or a classic internet troll where they were sort of making fun of the bags. But then obviously they made money off of it. So I think this is where you lose some rights around parody. Maybe I'm mixing up issues here. Untangle this for me as the lawyer. Yeah, so there's a convergence of both existing cases law and existing uncertainty about what is free speech and what is commercial speech and what is protectable and what is not and where the line is between something that is infringing under trademark law and then what is like protected free speech. There's actually a, a Supreme Court case now, not about crypto, but about Jack Daniels bottles versus chewable dog toys. So it's the same question, right? Like what, what is a commercial product and what is a parody? The Supreme Court is probably going to issue a decision on that in the next month. So that's like not doing crypto. Like there's just uncertainty in the law about like, where is that line, right? And then you throw on this crypto layer of, well, no, it's really a bag for the metaverse. It's not for the real, like no one's going to carry around this bag because it's just an NFT. But then that ties into like a real world issue, which every mega brand in the world right now is thinking about, well, are my trademarks for my physical products? Like, are those sufficient? Or do I need to now like start a new campaign of trademark applications to protect my items? in the metaverse as only digital items. And, and obviously our world is becoming more digital. So, you know, how much of my physical stuff is going to be confusing with things that may or may not be digital. And if Ian goes and creates something in the metaverse that's potentially competing with my physical item, where is that line? So there's a lot of uncertainty that is caused by this that isn't just related to blockchain. But then when yeah. you throw in the blockchain and just, I think the general confusion it brings up in like ordinary people, it certainly can create like, I think weird outcomes or unexpected outcomes or just ambiguity in what the outcome should be. Yeah. Can I get a trademark on a digital item if I haven't actually created it? So, sort of like carrying your conclusion to the next step, right? So presumably Hermes had not created an NFT collection of Birkin bags prior to this case, but could they have potentially been defensively applied to extend their trademark in some way to cover that case? Yeah, so it varies by country, um, okay. but in the U.S., there, there's something called an intent to use trademark, which says I plan to use this trademark, but I'm I'm not currently using it right now. And for sure, a ton of companies have been doing that over the past you know couple of years, saying I don't currently have a metaverse product on the market, but we're going to be doing something in the future, and so we're going to file sort of like a defensive trademark to broadly cover where we're going to be going. You do have to have a genuine intent to use the trademark in that kind of way, but assuming you cross that threshold, you can file something today and more or less reserve your right to use that in the future. And then you just have to make a filing in the future within a few years saying, here's the actual use of it in the virtual world. We kind of skipped over your current practice and what you're working on, but I, I would have to imagine that type of work is, is taking up a fair amount of your time these days. 
yeah, helping brands think about Web3 strategy is definitely an element of, of what I'm doing. And I will say when, when the market was uh, on fire and everyone was thinking about crypto and how much the metaverse was going to take off, there was a lot more of that. And I think it rides the wave of the broader crypto markets, so to speak, just as you know, a lot of the crypto economy does. But for sure, there's still a lot of companies that are planning for you know multi-year timelines to do some sort of digital or metaverse type experience, even as just a way to market their products or to have some sort of brand experience, right? So yeah. so there's, there's definitely a lot of that and i expect that's going to continue as you know even like this week i think it was just yesterday right apple announced their their vision headset so you think about how the metaverse starts becoming a <laughs> another thing that all these companies are thinking about how, how are our items going to exist in a digital universe and all of the intellectual property protections that go along with that the Apple announcement, by the way, if people haven't seen it, go watch the keynote. It's on apple.com. One of the amazing features is that when you op unbox one of these things, you turn the device around to your face and it scans your face and creates a lifelike avatar so that then when you're in a FaceTime call, particularly if you're in a FaceTime call with another person wearing one of these headsets, you both have this 3D avatar that is lifelike. But you could pretty quickly then imagine like, well, instead of it looking like me, I want it to have blue hair and I want Spock ears and Dracula teeth or something crazy like that. And then you're not really very far away from where we were a year ago talking about going from NFTs that were PFPs to then, you know, avatars re <laughs> realized in a metaverse. I was blown away by the announcement yesterday. I don't know if you I, I was you also very, very impressed. I have an Oculus and, and uh, I've experimented with it. And a lot of the things that I find frustrating with using it, even as much as I think it is like a really great device, seems Seem to be things that that Apple is trying to solve. So you know, I know it's not coming out till early next year, but I'm really excited to see how that technology develops, and, and not not just Apple, right? The whole ecosystem of AR and VR, and and tying that back into blockchain and metaverse type uses. Related topic: You posted something recently about AI, and can content be owned by an AI? Like, what is the IP ownership of a system like ChatGPT? And I feel like there's an there's an intersection here to the conversation that we're having about on-chain digital art, because it, it seems like the path, like cryptographic provability of both originally generated content or human generated content, maybe is a better way to put it, and LLM generated content is something that we're going to have to grapple with a lot. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the uh, the post and your position on, on this idea of AI? owned content. It's getting back to that legal ambiguity, right? As we were talking about before, if I create something, I take a pen and I draw on paper, that is presumptively original creative expression that is fixed on a tangible medium, which is the standard for copyright law. And that is protectable as a copyright in the US. It's just by virtue of creation. I can then, if I want to enforce it or sue someone, I can go to the copyright office and file for copy registration. And once I obtain that, I can go to court and say, hey, you are copying my original creation. And that's only one of the things that I have under this bundle of copyright rights is to create duplicates of the original copyrighted content. And so it's really simple that when you're like a creator or a musician, or there's just like, we understand the legal rights that attach to creations of content in those circumstances. And similarly, when we get to things that are you know not created by humans at all, or entirely kind of autonomously created, computer generated items, generally those are perceived as as not protectable, that there's no original creative human authorship. So the copyright protections do not attach to that content. And then when we get to generative content, there's different ways to think about it, but we're kind of grappling with at what point is, you know, me as the operator of say GPT-4, you know, LLM, and I, I'm conversing with it, I'm giving it inputs, I'm taking that feedback. I'm either merging different parts of it together or continuously giving it feedback to generate the output that I'm trying to achieve. At what point is that human creation? And the language model is really just a tool that I'm using to create something original, but that is directed by a human? Or is this just something that is more on that like non-human autonomously created side of things that there should not be protection for? And so I think the Copyright Office has started issuing guidance. There's been a few different people that have, through more like adversarial litigation type activities, been trying to get some more clarity on where those lines are. But right now, we don't have a lot of great answers as to exactly where that line is. There's an artist, uh, Chris Casanova, that created this, this comic book, Zarya of the Dawn. Uh, they used uh, Mid Journey to generate this comic book, and they wrote the text and fixed the image. And the whole thing is, it's Chris compiled it all together, but it was 
through kind of mid-journey prompt and so forth, right? So the compilation, I think the, the copyright office said is protectable, but each individual image may or may not be. So exactly where that's, got, that's, that's currently being appealed, I believe, exactly how that falls out. And there's a lot of other uh, instances. And so I also, I, I submitted a copyright application for my blog article that I did on the website. Same thing, just to experiment and see kind of where that line is for, for law firm created content, right? Because if I use ChatGPT to generate content and I'm a content marketer, you know, I, you know, I think it's the same for you, same for I'm sure a lot of uh, organizations out there listening. Like, you know, if I just use ChatGPT to create content, is that protectable? Do I have copyright in that? If someone knocks it off, do I have any leg to stand on to say, hey, knock it off? Or is it all just kind of a public good that now we have these language models that are just generating content that no one really owns. And I think as a society, like, right, getting back to like, what is the purpose of copyright law? Why are we even thinking about this at all? I think there's like questions that we need to grapple with as a society. It's like what we want to protect and why and what we're encouraging and kind of like a, a law and economics thing, right? Like what are the incentives we're creating by giving people copyright registrations or not? I think it must, on some practical level, which almost certainly doesn't intersect with the legal opinions on this one, but like on a practical level, it probably depends a lot if you view the AI as being a tool used by humans, like an augmentation or sentient or trending towards sentient. Because on one level, I could argue in the case of like the comic book created image, well, you could have done that with Photoshop or something, Adobe Illustrator or something else in the Adobe tool suite and arrived at a similar outcome. And in this case, the artists knew what they wanted and they were able to get to it quicker or more refined, less work or whatever it may have been. So better tool, but you still get the same outcome. It's driven by the artist. On the other hand, you could say, well, no, the person writing the prompt was merely like prodding the sentient thing to produce content. They were like a benefactor rather than the original artist and commissioning an image. And that, I think, just throws the whole world of copyright upside down, I would have to imagine, right? I think it's a problem that the existing laws can try and solve, but exactly where that line is of what is something that is created by the human or prodded versus what is not really hasn't been decided in this context. And so it will be interesting to see courts are already grappling with this and, and trying to figure out how to set up that issue and how to decide, you know, even like Microsoft Word, right? It's just a blank canvas. It's a technology tool that I use. Like, how does that compare to now Photoshop is allowing you to like draw a circle on a, an image and just click like generate something new. Like you can prompt within Photoshop. So even if you're using yeah. Photoshop, you can be using the technology in different ways yeah. and the different ways you're using it for perhaps different outcomes. Do we have to then like sit there and divide through how the technology is used in different ways in order to determine whether and how copyright law attaches to your creation? I don't know if you represent anyone in the TV movie industry, but obviously they're having a, the writers are striking right now. And one of the big issues is on this idea of can studios use something like chat GPT to author a script? And what does that mean for the compensation for the human writers, right? Is a big open question. Yeah, that's right. I agree with that, right? So if you're a studio executive, you're like, well, we don't need the writers. Let's just make the content ourselves. Even if the technology allows you to create human replacing content, you got to take a step back and think, what are these companies doing. These companies are in the business of generating content, which is then typically they're licensed or are owned by the studio. Then the studio is going to go monetize that. And the reason they're able to monetize that and exclusively license it to Netflix for hundreds of millions of dollars is because they own the copyright in that. So their, their whole business model is we generate content, we own the rights to it, no one else can exploit it except for us. And so then we're going to sell that to someone else and they're going to pay us to exploit the content. So if now you no longer have exclusive ownership and exclusive rights over the created content because it's created by an automated machine and not a human, and the copyright office says, no, we won't give grant you rights to exclusive rights of copyright to that. How does that impact really the whole content creation business model? Not just for content marketing, but for you're exactly what you're saying in the in entertainment industry. I think these legal questions feed directly into like, how do these language models upend like the traditional notions of economic activity and like generating revenue as a content business? And I think coming back to where we started the discussion with NFTs and blockchain, it seems like we're going to find ourselves quickly in a world where the creation of new medium to high quality content is largely free and instantaneous, right? Like language models proliferate, any, you know, many people become capable of driving them and we can create image and soon video. And obviously we're starting to see voice synthesis. So you get it in this world where it's like very easy to build a deep fake, the Apple vision demo, you got real life looking avatars that we now we can plumb via text in voice synthesis behind them. It seems like it becomes very difficult to distinguish in the world 
what is real or created by someone that you trust and like or interested in their content versus an, a cheap knockoff. The Meta Birkin or you know a disinformation deep fake. But it does feel like there is potentially a solution here in the universe of NFTs. Like I, a lot of people who I hear advocating for crypto blockchain broadly and NFTs specifically talk about this concept of digital scarcity where the internet, it's always been easy to copy any object infinitely at no cost in the digital realm. And suddenly this adds a layer where it's not so trivial to do that. And suddenly we can have like accumulating value. Do you see these things like converging in some interesting way? Or am I just drawing two big circles around the things I'm interested in and saying, oh yeah, it's all coming together. No, there's there's definitely two big circles and, <laughs> and sometimes they intersect. I think people think they intersect more than they actually do. But I think yeah. you're definitely onto something that the intersection of these two circles is definitely how does blockchain give us a tool to provide digital scarcity and to prove authenticity and to prove the source of you know authentic goods or services or personalities. And so I, I think there's a role there. I don't know that it's really been solved yet and certainly not at scale. But I think for sure, when you think about something like art blocks is an example of we have the randomized seed applied to the model to generate the art and it's fixed on the blockchain at the moment of minting of its creation. And you know that that token always represents that authentic generative piece of art based upon kind of the, the history of that NFT. Well, that's a perfect example of how this can be used in the art market for natively generative art. And for digital assets, I can kind of project forth how that can work for other digital assets. But then how do, how do we then translate that to, to real world physical assets and prove authenticity in that context? We've talked a lot about art so far. I keep looking at the guitars and is it a saxophone that's just over your shoulder? Tenor saxophone, yeah. And looking at your CV, like you started actually your career working in the music industry. And so I'm curious how some of the music projects that were launched as NFTs worked out. I think Kings of Leon put out a whole album that was an NFT. I know a couple other artists had a premium, almost like the box set of back in the day when people still sold CDs via NFT that delivered some royalty back to them. How has that progressed? Are people still still looking at doing that with NFTs or have they backed off that recently? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely some very successful music projects. It kind of mirrors the general market shape of mid-2021 into 2022. People are making a lot of money selling music as uh, NFTs or as something else. And I think some of that's waned, but I think exactly what you're describing, Ian, is that the technology has shown that it's a way for artists to reach their fans and to deliver different types of fan experiences in a way which perhaps wasn't either as easy or possible at all prior to the use of technology. Before I went to law school, I, I worked at an records and uh, a smaller record label management company. And uh, this was during the era of, you know, file sharing, right? And so that was a really interesting time to be in the music industry as the record labels were trying to figure out how to adapt and move away from CD sales. You know, there's a lot of parallels there with, I think, what's happening now. Um, I think especially like BitTorrent was something that was like a big issue then. You think about distributed decentralized file sharing. There's a direct parallel from that technology, I think, into decentralized blockchain technology and the way it works. And so the same way that media companies had to deal with that then and adapt and find a way, you know, like Spotify didn't exist at the time. I actually worked, you know, very briefly with a company called Groove Shark, which was like a pre-Spotify type file sharing company. And same idea is now we're in, in a new era where blockchain technology allows for the marketing and sale of media in a different way. And it changes the monetization model and companies need to adapt and figure out how that works for them if, if it does at all. But yeah, I mean, I, I worked with some really exciting projects over the past few years. You know, one of my favorite ones was in Decentraland, there's a, a music festival and uh, I worked with an artist that had NFTs that were sold as headphones. And if you bought the NFT and wore the headphone into like a VIP area, the VIP area was gated. Only people that wore the headphones could access the area. And then only people that were like physically present in that virtual space could listen to the album release before it actually was released. So you think about how you can combine like all of the different topics we've been talking about, which is NFTs that are gating access and creating a revenue model for like, a metaverse listening session. And we haven't talked about like NFT ticketing and all sorts of fun things that are impacting the music market specifically. 
Does the royalties model work? This was the thing that I remember about the artist who sold NFTs that I think on a specific song was every NFT owner received like a third of the total royalties he was paid per song. He was redistributing that. And my head immediately went to, oh, this sounds like a hugely complex tax problem because of the, the crypto involvement plus the royalty structure. And like, does this actually work in practice at all? Any experience, either that project or other the ones where they've tried to include royalty payments as part of the NFT to the purchasers? Yeah. And, and look, like for the artists I was working with in 2021, this was, I think, a big draw in the first place. This is why I think artists initially got really excited about NFTs and blockchain technology was, well, when I sell my art, I sell it once and I never get a royalty. But on the blockchain, I do, right? At least that's, that was the theory. And it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Just looking at the technology is that you know, you look at some of the marketplaces now that are post OpenSea and they're getting rid of resale royalties. So there's a whole issue there, just like in terms of technology, like what is possible and what can be circumvented in terms of ministering royalties on chain. I know there's EIPs and other proposed solutions to advance beyond that, but right now we're kind of in this weird space. And then you look at on top of that, all the weird legal issues in terms of, you mentioned tax is a great one. If, if people are getting resale royalties as listeners and, and let's like, you know, listen to earn kind of model who's paying taxes on that. I think also there's securities law and other regulatory concerns that come with that. And there's all sorts of things that just haven't been solved, right? There's not like a Spotify where you just like put in your credit card and, and it's done and it's like a clean user interface and everyone knows what's happening, right? So there's there's a lot to go until we have a platform, I think, that is going to solve that for everyone and solve these tax issues and regulatory issues and so on. We need someone to resurrect Napster and Groove Shark and figure all this <laughs> out for us, right? <laughs> Maybe a DAO can buy their their IP from someone. Exactly. As we wind down the podcast, this has been an awesome conversation, but I'm curious as you're looking out over the remainder of the year into next year, like where do you see you know, some of the legal precedent? Are there any big cases out there that you're keeping an eye on that we, we should be watching as well? There's the Meta Birkins case. There's the Yuga Labs, Ryder Rips case, uh, a few other ones. I'm tracking all of them. From the IP perspective, those are, of course, you know, really interesting. Obviously, the securities laws, and other regulatory cases like Ripple and, and now over the past week, you know, Binance and Coinbase. Those I think are going to be probably more important in a macro perspective. But me as the IP attorney, I get to focus on the, on the cases that I think are more fun. I think it's going to be interesting to see, yeah, there's some of these headline cases. I think even the Metabrookins one's a really good example, but that's a case that came out for this big, famous brand and how how can like regular business people like what lessons can they take home from there um so i think it, as you see kind of these decisions kind of being made and then trickling down to the broader ecosystem i think that's what's going to be interesting and, and kind of how the attorneys in the space adapt to that and how the businesses kind of adapt and overcome some of these challenges that they're seeing both from a technological perspective and from a legal perspective awesome mush how can people follow along with your exploration you're pretty uh good content creator twitter the best way to find you yeah twitter i'm at uh, at pelts m so my last name first initial my website's frblaw.com website for my firm you can find my profile there and thank you so much for having me on here this was this is fantastic i love the conversation and all the education appreciate the time today thank you take care hey there thanks for listening to another episode our team has been working hard to make our content available on all the major platforms so right now do me a favor take out your phone head over to your favorite social media app you can subscribe to our new tiktok our revamped youtube you can sign up for our linkedin newsletter and of course you can follow us on twitter or telegram just search for at chainalysis now back in 2016 the exchange bitfinex was hacked with thieves taking more than 120,000 bitcoin that were stored at the exchange change. It sent shockwaves through the crypto industry, but as of last week, it appears we're coming to a resolution in the legal process. Paperwork was filed in the case suggesting that the defendants will plead guilty in a hearing scheduled for August 3rd. If you haven't been following along, it appears that so far our U.S. authorities were able to recover over 94,000 of the stolen Bitcoin following a joint investigation by the FBI, the IRS criminal investigations team, and the Homeland Security investigative team. Additionally, in separate investigations, between August of 2022 and January of 2023, authorities were able to make additional recoveries from the initial hack, bringing their total recovered to over 108,000 Bitcoin, approximately 3.2 billion in today's value. Click on the link in the show notes to read our full blog on the case history and see where the Bitcoin has been over the last seven years.